the series that the first one, the first one started, um, was, was done in 2003. So we've been going for a couple of decades development of these plans. And I think we've been progressively getting better and better. We all know that that's critically important. That this, this is a critically important mechanism to coordinate regional and national actions to conserve uh, Pacific Islands endemic and migratory species. The process over, the, over these decades has been led by dedicated species advisors and officers, each with their own particular passion to conserve our threatened and endangered species. And that has been reflected to a large extent in the, in the, in the emphasis of the, a lot of the work that we've been doing. And that, that emphasis has been growing and expanding uh, over time. And it's important, I really want to acknowledge the work of our, our SPRIP advisors and, and, and officers during this time, because today is a SPREP day uh, and, uh, and, and it's really important for me to do that. However, the ongoing development of these action plans would not have been possible without the support of our equally dedicated partners within governments, specialist organisations and academia. It's been absolutely essential to providing the, the knowledge and, and research required to make uh, these action plans the highest standard and highest quality <clears throat> possible. We are, of course, relying on donors and partners to, su to support countries to implement the plan. And that has been a challenge for us. Um, despite the, the, the level of impact um, that um, the various iterations of our threatened and migratory species um, teams have, have, uh, have worked together to achieve over the years, it's always been a small team. And we have struggled, uh, to be quite honest, um, in providing and in, in getting, being able to provide the necessary financial resources uh, to, to support that work. And that then translates, of course, into um, not being able to have the, the level of, of staffing that we actually do re would require to address the scale of the issue that confronts us in the region <clears throat> in conserving threatened and migratory species. So that makes actually the work that we have done, I think, even more important. And, and we, we are also very thankful to those donors uh, and, and again, the partners that have provided the support to the support that have gotten us this far. I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to see that um, in this iteration of the of the action plan, we have the Seabirds Action Plan, produced with support from BirdLife International. That has been a gap uh, in our threatened and migratory species um, programming uh, over the past decades. And, uh, and finally, we've been able to address that, and that's great. So it joins the other critical species groups for which we already have action plans. The funding uh, to actually go ahead and, and implement these critical actions is improving. And already through the uh, bycatch and integrated ecosystem management uh, component that SPREP implements of the Pacific European Union Marine Partnership Program, which covers a diversity of actions uh, regarding uh, sustainable use of marine and conservation of marine species uh, and, and other ac actions in the Pacific. Um, so we've done, we're doing a lot of work through that um, project on turtles and uh, CITES work. But really importantly, under our new Pacific Bioscapes program, also funded by the European Union, we've been able to really build up the work that we are able to do for turtles, seabirds, and, and these societies. 
Uh, this will allow us to improve monitoring of turtle populations and to initiate work on seabirds. For the first time, we have uh, altogether in the various activities under this program, 600,000 US dollars for turtle work. And I'm sure that would make um, a late Louis Bell very happy, who was the one that pioneered our work on, uh, on turtles in the region. We have uh, $232,000 for seabird work and almost $300,000 for eCITES work. So altogether, you know, quite a substantial um, funding allocation, which will carry us forward at least over the next five years to address some of the issues that have um, been identified and recommendations that have been identified in the action plans. I think I've, I've, I've covered uh, the main points that need to be said this morning. And I know that all of you are going to, um, those, those who are going to speak will be providing us with more background and more interesting information this morning. And without further ado, I'd like to launch the, uh, the fourth iteration of the Regional Marine Species Action Plans. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Stuart. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks very much for that. And um, yes, we're delighted to launch the plan. And just before I pass over to our experts, I just want to, to give a brief introduction. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, so just want to take a quick look at the process we followed. Most of you know that the previous plan ran from 2013 to 2017. And that rev the review of that plan began in 2017 when a supplementary plan for sharks and rays was added. Then in 2020, through a secondment from DOC, Hannah Hendricks un undertook a review of the implementation of the plan with our SPEC members. And it was the feedback from that that assisted with drafting the new program for 2022-2026. And as Stuart has already mentioned, we've added for the first time a seabird action plan. Then in July last year, we had a series of online workshops, many, uh, which many of you uh, participated in. And we used that to review the draft program and to produce this final iteration of the action plans. So the, the online version, which is in English, is now available on our SPEC website. And Meta's uh, put that uh, link into the chat in case you haven't um, been able to have a look at it yet. Our intention uh, is to go ahead and translate into French and also to provide some printed copies. So just briefly, what is the plan? So it, it's a program or a regional strategy, really, for the cooperative conservation and management of the five groups of species that we're talking about now, which are now dugong, marine turtles, whales and dolphins, sharks and rays and seabirds. And its, its focus is, and its design is to support our Pacific Island countries and territories, not our MET members or metropolitan members. Though, as Stuart mentioned, uh, we are always grateful for their ongoing support, technical support, advice, and and the funding. So we have a new updated vision statement, a healthy Pacific Ocean with thriving populations of whales, dolphins, marine turtles, dugongs, sharks and rays and seabirds, and the associated ecosystems on which they depend and contribute, which assures the aspirations of Pacific Island peoples and protects their natural and cultural heritage. There has been a lot of progress over the last few years, and we're going to hear in a moment from the, some of those involved in that work. However, as Stuart mentioned, there is much still to be done. We know the Pacific Ocean is increasingly under threat, and yet it is vital to the Pacific Island economies and livelihoods. Marine species play a key role in Pacific people's lives. They're important in their cultural identity, as a source of nutrition, and in economies such as through tourism. But they are also key ecosystem drivers, influencing and maintaining balance within their ecosystems, providing important ecosystem services, 
which have immense value. And here I'm showing you one such service that has been receiving increasing attention lately, and that is around the carbon sequestration capabilities of our great whales. The dual threats of climate change, biodiversity loss threaten to upset this balance. And some commentators are now pointing to a new economic paradigm to value nature through a nature-based economic model, such as the services provided by these great whales. I hope over the next few years, we'll be able to find a way to recognize and compensate our Pacific Island countries for maintaining these natural assets, their marine tauranga, enabling them to develop economically. Pacific peoples are stewards of their marine environment, but these are large, very large ocean states, and they are primarily small island developing states. The plans provide important information needs and gaps and better ways to manage, but Pacific Island countries and territories cannot do it alone. SPREP has an important coordinating role outlined in the plan, supporting access to resources in terms of technical support and funding, such as through our partner organisations. But we also need to forge new relationships to accelerate this work and find new sources of funding. Even basic information is often lacking on population diversity, size and trend. It is important to realise that the dual threats of biodiversity loss and climate change I talked about earlier are not independent, but inextricably linked. Rebuilding marine species will support ecosystem resilience to climate change. And this important link with climate change has resulted in a new theme under each of the plans, specifically devoted to climate change. So before I go, I would like especially to thank Hannah Hendricks and the New Zealand Department of Conservation for supporting her work with us on the review and the preparation of these plans. And I also want to join Stuart in thanking the BirdLife team for the work on developing our first ever seabird action plan and the many others who spent time providing input into our draft plans. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And I'd like to invite Steph Burrell from BirdLife International uh, to give her presentation about seabirds. And I think you're able to share, Steph. Certainly am. Can everybody see that? Yep. Cool. Uh, kia ora tato e hui hui mai nei, ko Stephanie Burrell toku no tene ka mihi. Kia ora ana, bula vanaka, talofa, hello everyone who's here today. Um, I'm the Marine Regional Coordinator for BirdLife International in the Pacific Secretariat based in Suva. <clears throat> I work remotely from um, Tamaki Makaurau, uh, Auckland and Aotearoa, New Zealand. And my work is about seabirds. Um, and, uh, and like all the other species that are in the marine, uh, spread marine regional species action plans, they're not really doing that well on the old threatened species lists. And it's really hard not to get weighed down by stories of species declines and pending extinctions, the current climactic events and projections uh, for the natural world under climate change scenarios. And it's particularly visceral here in uh, Te Moana Nui, the Pacific. And it's hard to avoid in general that we're in the midst of a biodiversity crisis and seabirds are a part of that crisis. <clears throat> But like all great obstacles to overcome, as the Māori proverb says, he rāo ringa e o te ai, many hands make light works. And coordination, as Karen has mentioned before, um, is not only the driving force behind the establishment of SPREP 29 years ago, it continues to be the framework for which <laughs> the Marine Species Action Plans are um, written and implemented. And BirdLife and our partners uh, emphasise that we are committed and excited to continue to work with the SPREP Secretariat and members to improve conservation status for seabirds in the region. And, and that's because we're all looking in the same direction. The inaugural Seabird Action Plan, which was adopted last year, is a move to a more coordinated game plan for the Pacific to address this conservation crisis. And it was a real privilege to work on this with, um, with colleagues, some of them are here, I see, and, um, and others that are not, but to 
we worked on outlining the key priorities for seabirds over the next um, few years and, and incorporated lots of expertise from people all over the region. But I do want to emphasize that although this is the first seabird action plan as part of the marine regional marine species action plans, we aren't starting from scratch. Um, invasive predators are continue to wreak havoc on seabirds and land birds alike. And to date, um, BirdLife has supported the eradication of uh, invasive predators from 33 sites. And we are working hard with SPREP members and our partners to, uh, to clear more really important sites with breeding seabirds across the region. Similarly with bycatch and fisheries, um, which is a key driver in population declines of some species of seabirds, particularly albatrosses, vessels that we know that are interacting with albatrosses and petrels uh, often visit Pacific ports. And here we're using port-based outreach to educate skippers, crew and fisheries operators on mitigation measures that they can use to prevent seabird bycatch and including providing vessels with toy lines that are made by local women's groups in Suva. <clears throat> and of course, seabirds have and continue to be an important food source for some Pacific peoples, but combined with other threats, the harvest could be unsustainable um, and threaten, threaten harvest practices in the future. So we have some work um, in, in collaboration with SPREP to look um, to work with communities to assess the sustainability of their harvests and ensure that they can be continued into the future. And I'm sure none of us have been able to avoid the horrors of plastic ingestion in wildlife. Um, birds die from starvation and dehydration and toxic chemicals that are added to plastics and absorbed from the environment can transfer to seabirds, causing severe biological impacts. Um, but that also means that they can be transferred to people who consume the birds. So we're about to kick off a bird life and spread partnership um, to investigate how the transfer of chemicals may affect people that consume harvested seabirds in Vanuatu and um, also exploring methods for monitoring plas plastic ingestion in seabirds across the region more widely. But of course there are many more challenges as um, both Stuart and Karen have said that we have to tackle to save our seabirds, um, climate change which is affecting not only um, uh, foraging opportunities and, and prey distributions, but also uh, habitat, modif uh, habitat um, from rising sea level and inundation. Light pollution um, is another issue that, that we need to focus on. And of course, disease, which is also exacerbated by climate change. So we have much more work to do, but the SPREP Seabird Action Plan is the plan that we can use moving forward. Uh, and I'm really excited to, <clears throat> to continue that work. And no one is an island, and in the sea of islands, in the words of Epele or Haofa, um, in the Pacific we work together. together. Um, so I wanted to end this presentation with a, a short Māori proverb, uh, Waiho i te toipoto, kaua i te toiroa. Let us keep close together and not far apart. Um, so happy, happy 29th spread. Looking forward to working with, <laughs> with you all um, in the future. And yeah, that's me. Thanks very much, Steph. That was very, very interesting and gave us a really good look at, um, you know, some of the threats facing our seabirds. Probably something, some pretty new for, for some people. So um, I'd now like to invite... Um, I can't even remember who I was going to get next. I think it might have been Michael. <laughs> Cutting up his thumb. I think you should be able to share your screen. And Mick's going to give us a, a, a bit of a, a flavour of sharks. Thanks. Cool. Everyone can see that screen? You got the right one? Uh, yes. Yeah, excellent. Hi, okay, so um, yeah, thank, thanks again for having me here. It's a um, great honor to be able to speak on behalf of Sharks and Rays. Um, so my name is Michael Grant. So I'm based at James Cook University in North Queensland. Um, and I've been involved, I guess, in a few bits and pieces in the Pacific, um, mainly through my work in Papua New Guinea. So firstly, just want to extend a big thanks to Karen and Judy, Junie and Mike, um, 
who most of my communication in the development of this plan has been with. And thank you also to all the team members who contributed to the shark and ray section. So in the Pacific, we have about 190 species, although as we learn more, this number will continue to increase. For example, we've been doing a lot of work in Papua New Guinea and have been able to describe 12 new species in PNG alone between 2014 and 18. And we've additionally had a few surprises turn up, such as the first scientific observation of an adult, uh, adult species shark and this freshwater whipray that we were able to find owing to local knowledge reports of fishers in PNG's Kikori River. However, as we describe new species across the globe, our sharks and rays are in trouble. So we've now got an estimated 37.5% species threatened on the IUCN web list, and capturing fisheries is the primary issue affecting every threatened shark and ray. So the writing is really on the wall here for our threatened species. We need to reduce shark and ray interactions with fisheries. And a group that has been particularly susceptible are the oceanic sharks and rays that interact with high seas and pelagic fisheries. So over the last 50 years, we've seen a general increase in fishing effort within the long line and first seen sectors. And alongside this, we've seen a rather dramatic decline of about 70% in oceanic sharks and rays. So within the shark and ray action plan, there's no surprise to see a large emphasis on things such as improving bycatch mitigation methods and technologies, and also improving the post-release survival of those individuals that do find themselves caught in fishing gear. Now it isn't all bad. In the shallow coastal and coral reef areas of the Pacific, we are fortunate to have populations of species that have severely declined or disappeared entirely in other global regions. For example, I've been lucky to have spent the last three years surveying PNG's enormous river systems. And we've actually found pretty good populations of river sharks and sawfish that now require management if populations are to be maintained. So as we all know, small scale fisheries are a crucial aspect of culture, food security and economic opportunity across Pacific nations. And there really is a need to get boots on the ground in some of the Pacific's remote communities to understand the small scale fishery space better. And often a really good way to go about this is through collaborating with and supporting local conservation practitioners. So for the work I've done in PNG, I definitely owe a lot to Yolani and the Piku Biodiversity Network who have been crucial in harnessing local knowledge of small scale fishers to understand their management needs better. For example, through project facilitation with the PBN, we've been able to identify the driver of inshore fishing across southern PNG as being a high value East Asian market, Telios swim bladders. And the value of these swim bladders is so high that meat comparatively has very little value and discards from the swim bladder fishery can be a common sight on landing beaches. So SPREP have been supporting our work to document bycatch rates of this fishery to assist in development of a much needed um, swim bladder fishery management plan. And I think this example really highlights that across the Pacific, there is a need to get into the field to really understand the local drivers of these small scale fisheries to ensure informed and culturally appropriate management plans can be developed. So a couple of quick things before I finish up. Along with Dr. Andrew Chin, also here at JCU, um, we are conducting an Indo-Pacific wide program where for each country we are aiming to provide species lists and summarise the literature across various management related themes. And a key part of this process is collaborating with local actors to ensure that we are providing the most relevant and needed information for each country. So thanks again to Spret who have been supportive of this project. And please jump on the website here if you're interested to learn more. And lastly, a few things to keep an eye out from the IUCN SSG. So we're currently updating the Global Condrithian Status Report, and I'm happy to share that the Pacific will have three chapters focusing on the status of sharks and rays in nations within each of Melanesia, Polynesia and Micronesia. So I'll be coordinating much of the Pacific section and I look forward to hopefully working with some of you on aspects of that. 
And additionally, the IUCN SSG are working on development of an important shark and ray areas program. And the Pacific is likely to have several sites identified within that initiative. So stay tuned for that one. So all in all, it's a big job ahead for sharks and rays in the Pacific. And I really think this guiding action plan is going to be a big help in ensuring we are collectively working towards key objectives and allocating our often very limited resources to the priority areas and issues. So thanks again to everyone involved and please stay in touch on my email if you have any questions around sharks and rays in the Pacific. So thanks again and a big happy birthday to Sprep. Thanks very much, Mick. That was amazing. Uh, fantastic introduction into the, um, the amazing diversity of shark species up in PNG and the Kokori Delta and the threats that some of them are facing. So thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that as the years go on. Um, so I'd like now to introduce our next speaker, um, which I think is going to be Christina. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Morning, everybody. Let me just see if I can share my screen. How's that? Okay, I'll go. Okay, so um, my name is Christina Shaw and I run the Vanuatu um, Environmental Science Society, which is a small NGO in Vanuatu. Um, we, I guess we're, I'm looking at it from a different perspective to the other speakers in the group being um, a recipient of lots of uh, help and advice from experts from around the region. Um, so I'd want to kind of tell a little bit of our story in um, how we've been helping dugong conservation here in Vanuatu. I think one of the big initiatives which happened before I was started in dugong conservation was the Pacific Year of the Dugong, which was a SPREP initiative in 2011. And as I said, that happened before I'd even started my little um, NGO. And we can still hear people talking about it. So these sort of regional um, initiatives, even if they're, you know, not, not got huge amounts of money or what have you, but they collaborate and get people together talking about dugongs or whichever species they happen to be. I think they can have um, quite a long lasting impact. So, but one project that we were involved in was the Jeff funded dugong and seagrass conservation project, which happened a few years ago. Um, and that involved a couple of Pacific Island countries um, in amongst the eight that were involved in the, the whole project. So dugongs aren't necessarily the easiest species to research or monitor, um, it's particularly in remote um, islands, but there are various techniques that we can use. Some of them are low tech, um, which is we used in under that project, which was a questionnaire survey. Um, and that it, questionnaire survey, which involved interviews with fishers, um, basically we went around asking people where they see dugongs, what sort of fishing gear they use, and we came up with these dugong hotspot maps. So we can update the distribution of the dugongs throughout the archipelago, and also find out where uh, there are most dugongs and they're facing the most threats, particularly gillnet fishing um, in, in Vanuatu. And the good thing about the questionnaire survey that we used, it was the one that was developed by the Dugong um, or the CMS Dugong Secretariat and their group of technical experts, is that it is standardized. So we can compare across different countries. Um, so that's our, our low tech uh, one that doesn't cost too much money and then it's, it's doable by lots of different um, organizations across the Pacific. So we can also use some more um, modern technologies. Um, and we have just recently done some drone surveys. So helped um, it, very much so by Chris Kleger, who was at Modoc University, um, PhD on um, dugongs in New Caledonia, um, and has now just moved to G JCU. Um, and um, also Amanda Hodgson, who was at um, Murdoch University. So this is another example of a sort of collaboration from outside the region to um, our small um, organizations within the region. 
and we have, even though we had quite a few technical challenges, um, as well as getting permissions from all the various authorities to do our surveys, um, these two photographs do show that we've proved the concept that it is possible to do dugong surveys in a small um, Pacific island country out of that, that boat in that picture on the left is where we flew the drones from. So the technology is, is coming on now so that uh, we don't have to rely on expensive manned aerial surveys um, to find out more about our dugongs um, in our remote Pacific islands. Um, and then here on the, on the right hand picture, it looks a bit murky, um, but you can see there's a dugong feeding in amongst the, the reef there. The other things that we've done is created dugong guidelines for interacting, um, particularly aimed at tourism, but also um, anybody that comes across dugongs on, on the coast. Um, we have our dugongs in Vanuatu have a particularly uh, friendly reputation and inappropriate interactions from tourism um, and others was cited as a, a threat to dugongs. So we came up with these guidelines as to what to do when you see a dugong. And we're happy to say they've been adopted by um, tour guides um, and dive operators in, in the country. So we, we know that they're being used and, and are working as well. So we're um, quite happy about that. Of course, you can't have dugongs without their habitat. So um, Karen spoke earlier about it, how, how the plans are for keeping our um, species healthy, healthy within their own ecosystems and habitats. Um, and again, we started using seagrass watch methodologies to monitor four different seagrass beds in Vanuatu. Um, and there, again, it's, we found it easy to do this because there was a program that's already um, there. We don't have to um, trial it. We don't have to design it, don't have to trial it. Um, it's comparable with other um, monitoring that is done in the rest of the world. And we can also contribute to a global database. Um, and our information has been used in a couple of um, scientific publications as well. Um, and I guess all of the uh, activity around dugong conservation as well has, has allowed the fisheries the confidence to start putting out in uh, enforcement activities as well. So uh, for the first time, penalty notices have been given to people that um, have been found to kill dugongs or keep them a little dugong calf inappropriately. So these... Um, the activity around the conservation actions also give the authorities that um, confidence to start taking actions when um, things don't go quite right. And I think also one of the great things about working together with the local organizations is we can capacity build the uh, local teams. So over the number of projects that we've had for dugongs, um, we've had lots of uh, um, marine or marine science and environmental science graduates that have come and worked with us um, and we've also um, invited others to come and do the seagrass monitoring and, and various things like that so I think um, it would be good to see maybe in 10 years time have having more Pacific Islanders that are presenting on the next lot of plans and the expertise that they're they've gained uh, whilst working collaboratively um, to across the Pacific as well. Um, and I guess one other thing that I sort of wanted to mention as well, with a lot of the emphasis on um, climate change happening now, and I kind of want to make sure people, particularly when speaking to donors, don't forget our species. Um, I've been involved in a um, proposal recently, which um, started out as a dugong and seagrass um, project and ended up as only a seagrass project. And we were told if we have any dugong components in it, we're not likely to get funded. So, um, and this is a trend that we've seen a little bit as well. So yes, we need to start talking a lot about climate change because that's where the money is. But some of our species, though, we haven't got the scientific links that are really strong with that climate change yet. 
So that might be an area where we need to look at to make sure that we can prove that what we're saying about the lynx is true. Um, but there are species as well that don't have those really strong links. So we need to make sure that they're represented in the projects as well, um, not just those that sequest carbon. Um, so I guess that was my little um, hope that that those these having these plans will actually keep the species that are important um, at the forefront of people's minds as well. So um, this is I like this photo because it looks like the dugongs are smiling. So hopefully with these plans and more coordinated action, there's uh, dugongs aren't in the whole of the Pacific, um, just on the uh, in the Western um, islands. Um, but we hope we can keep them smiling. There's lots of people doing good work on them in Palau, New Caledonia. Um, under that recent project, Solomon's um, introduced laws to protect them. So uh, there is momentum there that I hope these plans um, will keep that momentum going um, and keep that collaboration going as well, because we could not have done all that we've done with the dugongs in Vanuatu without help from lots of different people um, around the region. So thank you. Thanks very much, Christina. That was a great presentation and so good to see the capacity building work that you're doing with um, young marine scientists in Vanuatu as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, so our next speaker, and I'm just moving quickly on because we've, we've only got a total of an hour. So we've got two more presentations yet. The next one is from Mike Donoghue. Um, and so Mike, uh, you have the floor, and I think you want me to share the plan. Let me just see if I can do that. Thanks, Karen. That would be great. Yeah. I'll just share my screen. Well, I can start talking because I'm mainly talking anyway. Um, First of all, thanks to all the presenters so far. You're just That's fabulous. Nice. Um, and thank you very much, Karen, for the opportunity to speak at the launch of the um, Species Action Plan. Um, these have had a cetacean-esque gestation period, uh, as Stuart observed, it's but good. it's been well worth the wait. They're a fantastic set of plans. Um, and I want to also start by saying happy birthday, Sprep, and good on you for timing it with exactly the same day as my wife's 70th birthday, which is the excuse I'm using for saying, I'm sorry, I haven't had time to prepare a brilliant um, slideshow like the others have, but I want to talk about a, a few of the issues around the plan. Um, First of all, uh, I'd like to mirror the thanks to Hannah for all the work she did in preparing uh, the ground for the final product. And uh, in my time in Karen's chair, I did a lot of work towards this product and I thought it's never gonna get there, but it's a great document and it's going to be extraordinarily helpful. All the plans are really good. I don't need to walk through them with you. Um, but I do want to say a really, really and sincere big thanks to Karen for all the work she's put into this. All the people, and there are dozens and dozens of them who've contributed towards this. All the expertise that's come from within country and from overseas. And um, also, a Big thanks to Betty Lynn for the editing job. I think this is one of the highest quality productions for an action plan I've ever seen. It's really well pitched. It's extremely valuable and will help a lot. Um, oceans and threatened species, are of course, the focus of a lot of global attention these days, as others have said. And having such a simple, well laid out, clear plan is going to be really helpful for all the Cisco countries and territories who want to protect their iconic species. <laughs> Over 10% of the planet's ocean surface. So this is a very important document that will stand the test of time, I'm sure. 
Um, I'm particularly impressed by its production values. It's a great document. Um, as you probably know, the uh, Whale and Dolphin Action Plan is organized along the lines of the Regional Action Plan. And I also wanted to um, back up what Stuart said about the BIEM program which has been funded by the EU and administered by SPREP. Uh, it has a lot of stuff relevant to all the plans, but for the Whale and Dolphin Action Plan, it's particularly important because it has an emphasis on bycatch. And as uh, we know, we've been talking about bycatch in the region for a long, long time, but actually there's so much information that's come forward from the BIAM project that we now realize that bycatch of cetaceans in commercial and artisanal fisheries is a major problem. Let's hope that the lessons learned in the BIAM program can be um, rolled out across the region. Okay, so Karen, if you can roll us forward to the first theme. Thank you. You can see how good the uh, photographs and things are. OK, so the plan, as you know, is organized into themes and objectives. So for the first theme, research and monitoring, can you roll on, please? Um, I want to acknowledge, first of all, all the other people who, some of them, like Claire Garrigue and Michael Paul, live in the region other members of the South Pacific Whale Research Consortium. Um, I see that Karen Stone's online from VIPA and numerous people around the region are involved in collecting information. And I think the really valuable thing about this plan is that there are now a lot more tools with which to do the things we've been talking about for a long time, like, um, dealing with strandings, opportunistic sightings at sea with a good photograph can be plugged into databases like Happy Whale and huge amounts of information can be derived from that. Uh, there's been a new update by SPREP on the strandings database that will really help us gain information about stranded animals. These are all sort of new innovations since the last um, plan and make objective one of theme one much more achievable. Yes, roll on, please. Um, in research and monitoring, particularly would like to acknowledge the contributions of all the people around the region who've been involved in working on stations and who will be the um, supporters, along with governments and local NGOs of the future work under the plan, such as the consortium. Also like to acknowledge the work of Claire Cahig and Rochelle Constantine and others, including some of the speakers today on important marine mammal areas, which another new innovation for this plan. Yes, please carry on. As I said earlier, the work under BIM will help to inform bycatch mitigation. As Karen and Christina have observed climate change is now front and center along with the biodiversity crisis. So it's great to see so much attention being paid to climate change and particularly not only the impacts of climate change on whale and dolphin species, but also the impact of cetaceans on mitigating climate change. Karen put up the whale pump earlier, and this may help to unlock funding to do some of the work we know definitely needs to be done <coughs> and to provide a real value to um, conservation efforts. So if we can carry on, please. Habitat protection. Yes, hooray for important marine mammal areas. I'd like to acknowledge the work that's been going on in Kikori Delta with Mick Grant and Wilma Marvea and Yolani Amepu, which is being supported by the BIAM project. Yes, please. Next, threat reduction. 
we need to find ways to mitigate the impacts of fishing. Not own sustainable fisheries is not just about sustainable fish stocks, it's also about sustaining all the other important components of the marine ecosystem. So all the action points there are highly relevant. Yes, next please. Another really important thing that's come through in this plan better than it has in previous plans is not just the cultural significance of whales and dolphins as a um, icon for Pacific peoples, but also some communities' relationships with them and exploring how we can find ways to sustain that relationship. Um, legisl legislation, policy and management, we need to back up a lot of the aspirational goals with leg legislation. Ecotourism and livelihoods, as we know, everybody in the International Whaling Commission laughed when about 40 years ago, Robbins Bairstow said, you know, whales worth more alive than dead. But now uh, we can see that he was a man of his times or well ahead of his times. And ecotourism and livelihoods is a really important Thing for a number of Pacific Island countries, and this is a really good framework to take that forward. Next, please. Finally, on capacity building collaboration, um, we talked a lot about capacity building. I just want to mention very briefly important collaborations in the international amongst members, but also with the international one has a very strong relationship. Conventional species, which has a lot of background work that's plugged into this um, plan, and CITES, as Stuart mentioned. Finally, education and awareness. Um, I really love the fact that this plan finishes with an indicator of an annual whale celebration event becoming a focal point. So um, I think this plan is fantastic. You know, it's all laid out there for you. But it's a long, long list, but it's all achievable. Um, the time's never been better to implement off an action plan in the region. There's never been a better plan. Good luck with implementing it. What are you worth? Thanks very much. Thanks very much. To have a look at the plan to see the themes, the same themes, of course, that are covered in all the other plans as well. So, we'd like to quickly welcome to our final speaker, um, Anissa. Um, Anissa is going to talk a bit about um, some work that we have to do with biological integrated ecosystems management program. Anissa. I'm just going to um, touch on some of the work that's at the moment uh, in relation to the being funded under the BICAC Integration Management Program or BEAM, um, as it's as it's called. So BEAM is a um, is a four-party program being funded by the EU, as as was mentioned before. It's focused on bycatch mitigation, conservation activities. And we're working on um, activities that have been identified as priorities by the Solomon ICG to uh, PNG and Tonga. And it's been led by um, There's a whole border program with SPC and FFA and on, but the run is uh, being led by SPEP. And IUCN is delivering one component of it, and Yara, who is me, um, is delivering uh, another component of it. Um, Tierra Tier an NGO based out of Australia that works across Asia Pacific on um, building resilient communities and reversing nature law by unlocking transformational change. So the, the components I'm going to talk about are 5.4 to 5.8, and there's a video that's being funded uh, to them. In the interest of time, I won't go through this in much detail, but I'm happy to take questions later. 
So there's some really key pieces of work happening at a regional level at the moment that are really going to set the region in a good position going forward to strengthen all the good work that's been done on turtle conservation, but take a more holistic systems approach to how we um, try the drivers and threats that are impacting on turtle populations in the region. So there's a turtle, regional turtle extinction program um, underway at the moment to understand what is happening for the, for the fire species that we find in the region and um, where, where extinction are with species so that we can inform regional and national conservation and management approaches. Um, and to support that, we have uh, community use surveys underway in Fiji, Tonga and Papua New Guinea. Uh, and as Dana mentioned, um, community surveys are really effective. They're low tech, but really effective at getting a good understanding of what's happening in terms of turtle use and how turtles have been and for why. Um, <laughs> At the, at the local level, there is um, a variety of different programs underway specific to each country. So we've got, um, for the first time in the Pacific, we're starting to understand what is happening in terms of turtle nesting and climate change. So we've got a number of weather stations and um, sand temperature data loggers deployed across Vanuatu, Fiji, PNG and Tonga. And the idea being that we, we know in Australia, for example, where I'm based, that Santa is causing all turtle hatchlings to hatch as females, which is going to create problems down the track. But we don't know what's happening in the Pacific. So we're working with WWF as part of their Cool Turtle Project, which is a regional thing, um, to understand what is going on in the Pacific so that we can then work out whether we have an issue here or, or, or if it actually might be a stronghold, which then means in terms of management response, it becomes a really critical part for, for the globe for turtle conservation. Um, we've also got some different reviews and, and um, updates of plans underway. So Francis Hickey's been doing a, a national review of turtle management and conservation in Vanuatu to understand what's happening and where we've got gaps and, and, and what else needs to be done, which again is about strengthening management and conservation. That one's almost, um, almost ready for publication. Um, we've got, uh, oh, what's going on, it's gone backwards. Um, we've got genetics training happening um, as well across the region. So LAVE is working with SAP and a variety of WWFs to train technical experts that work on genetics to help strengthen in-country capacity around genetic research. Um, I mentioned before the CITES work relating to turtles. So under CITES, there's some obligations, although turtles are a appendix one listed species, they're not allowed to be um, traded um, internationally, but under um, the last CITES COP, there were some obligations that came out around turtles at the domestic level as well as the regional level, which are really important um, to, to understand what that means in, in terms of countries' um, requirements and obligations. So we're working to strengthen capacity in that area. We have a workshop coming up in August um, that's soon to be advertised that will focus on strengthening uh, city and understanding whether Pacific, we're, we're actually already addressing the obligations required for turtles. We're running a regional based extension program at the moment, uh, bird life in, in Fiji, and it's, it's about to start in Vanuatu, um, contracted directly with the fisheries department over there. And it's about improving uptake of bycatch mitigation for species of special interest, such as turtles focused on the long line fleet um, that targets tuna. And so a whole bunch of things are happening uh, in terms of capacity building and training for crews around turtles to do with um, uh, turtle de-hookers and line cutters and uh, resuscitation of turtles and those sorts of things um, as they come up with bycatch, how to avoid. One um, new mitigation that is called a hook pod, which was originally designed um, for seabirds, but there is a new version of it 
that potentially will help reduce the impact of um, turtles taking baits from the long line sector as well, uh, which we're hoping to trial uh, in Fiji. It's taken a long time to get going, but hopefully that will start soon. Um, subject to funding, we'll also look at doing a regional learning exchange for turtle monitors and rangers um, uh, down the track. There's updates to national plans of action happening underway at the moment for turtles in Solomons and Vanuatu. Christina from VERS is doing the one for Vanuatu and WCS is working on the Solomon Islands one. So that will help uh, update needs and priorities uh, for government in their obligations. And then we're looking at a couple of other activities down the track potentially um, to support uh, awareness raising and um, helping strengthen education and understanding around moratoriums and so on to do with turtle taking in a variety of countries like Tonga and Fiji. Um, we just completed two community, community turtle management plans in Vanuatu, in Bamboo Bay and Waiwai. Um, we've got actions that will then come out in terms of how we um, proceed around the turtle extinction risk assessment and um, we've been updating trends. So I'll leave it at that and say happy birthday, Sprep. And um, I guess as a, as a last point, just to fill up on the climate change discussions, um, species of special interest or these species that are in these action plans, it's more than, it's, it's not just because they're important culturally or because they're um, important from our point of view, these species are the things that drive our world. So seabirds, if we didn't have seabirds, we would not have fish. We would not have food security. They drive the ecosystem. The same as the turtles, the dugongs, the whales, the dolphins, they, are, they create the nitrogen cycle, the oxygen cycle, everything about how we operate as a planet. So how we move towards this nature positive world is really, really key. And so these action plans actually can play a key role in getting that debate out there so that it's more than just we're trying to protect them because they're charismatic and everybody loves a dolphin. To this dolphin and this whale and this dugong and this turtle is absolutely fundamental for food security for our communities in the region. So I will end on that note and hand back to Karen and happy birthday spread. <laughs> Thanks, Anissa. That was wonderful. And you absolutely echo my, my thoughts around um, marine species protection as well. Uh, not just iconic, but key ecosystem drivers and direct links to, to climate change as well. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, perhaps marine species can benefit a bit more in the future from, from climate change funding. So... Well, that really brings us to the end of our presentations today and absolutely uh, almost on time. We're just slightly over. So it means we don't really have time for, for any discussions. Um, but I do hope that everybody enjoyed the presentations um, and will take the, uh, the action plans away. And they're available online and there is a link uh, if you just joined recently um, go back to, up to the chat. Perhaps, Murder, if you could repaste the link again into the chat, because I think lots of people have been joining um, as we've been going along the link to the action plans. And um, we, are, we are hoping um, to be able to translate them into French and produce some, some hard copies as well. So unless there's anybody else, perhaps Stuart wants to, to say a few words to close, but otherwise I think we are nearly done. Stuart. Uh, yes, thanks, Karen. Hopefully a couple of words. Um, just to thank everyone for participating today and delivering those really great uh, presentations that um, highlight not only the importance of the issues that we're dealing with, but also how we're addressing them. And um, we, we are all aware that um, <clears throat> we are dealing with urgent issues um, regarding species conservation and, and a more effective management. And um, let's all continue to work together as well as we have done. Uh, over the next few years and 
from myself and Karen and the rest of the SPREP team, uh, thank you all for participating and, uh, and your contributions not only today, but on an ongoing basis and what you've already provided. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much to the speakers. See you all again soon. Bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.